Hey everyone, welcome to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. We're coming to you courtesy of our broadcasting partner, moretalk.tv. Joining me today on the show is Robin Wimbiscus. Robin is a freelance illustrator for such companies and publications as Chelsea Green, Organic Gardener, Mother Earth News, and Northern Woodland. And she's done this for more than 30 years. She served as a visual arts teacher and the chairwoman for the arts department for two therapeutic boarding schools in Vermont before opening her own company called Realign. This company offers a program she developed called Intuitive Art Education. Her method uses a single freeform watercolor painting to discover the vibrational qualities and frequencies of color and what attracts or repels an individual based on their personality type and their current emotional state. You can learn more about her work online at wimbiscusintuitiveart.com. Robin, thank you so much for joining us today on Reflections. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And I want to start off with a little background into your work. Um, could you explain to us what is intuitive art education and art journaling? Sure. Um, it's, just, it's, it's a name that I kind of came up with um, about 14 years ago. Um, I started teaching in a therapeutic boarding school here in Vermont. And a lot of times the kids would come into the art room. Well, first they hated art. They hated art teachers. Um, just really struggling. <laughs> so they would come in from therapy, and um, I just let them play. Um, just kind of began a whole method where you just put water on the paper, you let the colors go. There wasn't any thinking involved. There wasn't any technique involved. They didn't have to learn anything. Um, and what happened was I began to understand kind of the communication with the colors and what the students were going through. Um, and it took, it took about eight years of um, this method and, and asking these questions and having this communication that I realized I could actually teach it to other people. And that's kind of when I got really excited that what I was actually looking at was a language um, and something that was really important. Right. And how, how did you take this method out from the classroom and expand it in um, teaching it to other people? Well, what happened was uh, we had a lot of workshops for ed consultants, for therapists, for parents. So right then at the school, um, I, was, I was doing these workshops and doing it with these educators and these other people. Um, when the schools closed uh, a couple years ago, I decided that I just I wanted I wanted to get it into the public school system. I, I just wanted to get it everywhere. Um, right. So I did. I developed a, a practice, um, both um, individually and in the in the public school system. That's excellent. And what did you find was coming out as you introduced this technique and let the kids and, of course, later on others um, just kind of free flow with the watercolor. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the beginning of that. Um, what did you find was coming up? Um, what were, what were you, you getting? What was the result of letting them free flow with their watercolors? Well, what I found is, um, you know, a lot of different types of personalities um, kind of present themselves. One is a processing style. So there are certain people who process certain ways, and... Um, you know, I call it the blue and the orange, um, and they're very different. And so if you're talking to someone who is very intuitive and listens to their intuitions and you bombard them with facts and directions, there's a good chance they just they don't, they can't learn that way. So one right. of the first things that, you know, I noticed was um, just by talking differently to different personalities, I was able to reach them and communicate better. Um, and then I see a lot of other issues that, um, especially early on, um, just kind of personality traits about um, destructive behaviors that could manifest or, or come up later on as they're growing. Um, with adults, it usually ends up really indicating some fears, um, some, some protections and questions about what's holding them back, what's, what's making them want to follow their dreams. So um, the, the spectrum is really kind of big as to, to what it covers and what you can see in one simple little painting. Right. 
So you gave them no instructions. You just gave them the watercolor and told them to go with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, a lot of times what, they get a little nervous in the beginning, but it's actually right. very relaxing on top of it. Yeah, absolutely. You don't get that often where people, you know, and especially in an academic setting where you just say, go with it, just do whatever you want. That's nice. What's been really kind of nice, too, for the educators is there's no questions involved. In fact, it's a very nonverbal um, type of communication. So I have um, a lot of um, educators in the area who, who do it first thing in the morning so they can really see where their students are just by looking. Right. They just walk around the room and that's it. They can, they can tell how the day is going to go and they can plan their day according to the, the students' needs. Wow, that's a powerful tool. Did you find there was a difference or sim even similarities between the adults and the children that you've worked with? Um, well, similarities is the fact that, you know, just everybody's the same. We all have stuff, you know, um, mm -hmm. and every day those paintings change a little bit. Not necessarily your personality type, but um, whatever you're going through. And what's, what's cool, a lot of the therapists who use this as a tool say that it can cut like six months of therapy because depending on what the colors are next to it kind of pinpoints exactly exactly what you should be working on or what the issue is so it doesn't require a lot of storytelling and a lot of times for people they just don't have those answers it's, it's all emotion um, right so it's, it's, yeah and what were you doing when, I, obviously you said uh, this was helping you to learn more about their personality and even things like fear and, of course, things that they're going through. What were you doing with the results at the time? Were you keeping track of this or was it just something for your own personal use? Well, I have, I have like 14 years worth of research here. Um, what I'm finding really fun um, is the fact that when I get to teach, um, you know, educators, parents, and therapists as a tool, that this is just a tool for learning a language and for recognizing it. Um, if, if, if there needs to be more um, done, you know, they use their own tools. They use their own gifts of, of what they went to school for. Um, I do have, I do have a, a clientele that I do life coaching with. Um, so I have a lot of um, individuals as well. Um, right. And in your life coaching practice, you, of course, incorporate this into it. Um, how else have you found ways to incorporate art into your, your life coaching practice? Well, a lot, uh, on top of, um, you know, using this as a tool to guide them and to help them move through some of those fears um, for following, you know, all of those those really heavy dreams that we want to do for ourselves, a lot of my, my clients are musicians or artists or they want to get into business. Um, so we use the, the art, you know, in, in many different forms that way. Um, right. Some of my individual clients, um, we, we also do, um, I call it past life or message paintings. Um, which are very, very different from, from the, 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 the free flow, just the watercolors. Can you talk a little bit about, that's, that's probably a concept that listeners are, are not familiar with. Um, well, a, a yeah. Um, it's it's uh, something that I developed that came from doing the free flow watercolor paintings, actually. Um, the more that I, I kind of let those paintings go and, Watercolor is so unique because it's, it's difficult to control sometimes, which is why I think I like it. Um, so the, it's, it's a method where you, I put down a gesso, which is a white paste on your paper that dries completely white, so you can't notice that it's there. Um, but before it dries, I, I kind of run my hands through it and just put, put some of my own energy in there. When it dries, it's a series of light washes of color, and what happens is that the watercolor will sink to the bottom part, leaving the white areas kind of revealed. And what happens is these um, these figures begin to form: um, people, animals, insects. Uh, I get a lot of feathers in mine. Um, so I've been teaching this to um, some of my individual clients who come here to the studio. I've done a, a few water, um, a few workshops in them. But what happens is you start as as you relax with it, 
you become um, very intimate with those um, personalities that are beginning to paint. They were very familiar. Um, and your intuitive voice starts to speak to you. Um, so I teach people to journal through all of their thoughts, all of the feelings, memories, anything that kind of happens while you're enmeshed in this painting and having these figures come out. Some of these paintings can take up to a month to, to create. It's, um, it's kind of like re- reading a really good novel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It seems like it's almost a form of meditation because you allow you you get that deep connection to your inner your inner soul your inner drive and you allow it to just flow out onto the paper. That's that's is it? Would you call it a meditative activity? It's completely meditative. A lot of times yeah. people don't really realize how much time has gone by. Right. Um, and and again, you you keep revisiting this painting until it's funny. You know you know when your lesson has been taught. Um, you get mm-hmm. it, and, and you move on to the next painting. That's wonderful. And what, what are the results that you see in the people who are actually participating? Do you see um, a change, a shift that happens as they do this, and of course as they, as they complete their paintings? Oh, it's huge. Um, I had one woman in particular who um, was doing a past life painting, um, and as she, it, like I said, she would call me back and forth as these, as these figures kept emerging from her painting, and there were so many. Um, and the last figure that emerged from this painting was she was sure that it was her grandmother giving her this message. And, and the whole painting was um, it seemed scary at the time to her, which was skulls and, and women's breasts. And as she walked through this painting with me, she told me that almost all of her female um, family members have died at a very early age of breast cancer. And it was her biggest fear, her biggest fear. And as she finished, this is on the last day of the painting, as she finished it, she just got this message that said, stop worrying and start living life. Don't, oh, don't, wow. you know. Yeah, and it was just, so she, she bought a motorcycle and she travels and she's actually having a lot of fun right now. So that was probably one of the bigger, just quick moments of, oh, I need to stop living in fear. Right. Absolutely. Something that comes to mind personally that I would do a lot um, as I was going through school growing up in public school was I would doodle a lot. And of course, it's this is um, a, a little bit of a different form, but my doodles usually took the form of, of just a free form. I wouldn't think about what I was drawing. I would kind of let my, my hand go. Did you Do you find a connection between that, what kids doodling in school, and then of course, allowing them to do this watercolor form? Well, that's, yeah, absolutely. I have um, a lot on, on, on that particular form. It's very meditative. A lot of times part of the, um, my practice is that the watercolor itself is kind of the question, and you, you ask yourself a question and you, you just let the colors go. And when that painting is dry, taking either silver markers or pens or anything and just going over the, over the painting in any kind of shape or form. What I also found interesting when I was working in the therapeutic schools, um, we had a lot of children um, with ADD or ADHD um, really right. struggling in the mainstream classroom. Um, and so what we found was if we allowed the students to doodle, you know, over their watercolors or whatever, um, they were actually, they're, they're brilliant. They're just brilliant, brilliant children who could um, obtain everything that they were listening, participate, and be able to sit still um, as long as they were doing that meditative form at the same time. So it was really fascinating, and a lot of our students were actually able to go on to a a mainstream school as long as they were allowed to bring that form with them. Um, So, yeah, some people, it's it's just a, a perfect tool. Right. Absolutely. It's for me personally, it seems like something that I I would just, I would devour it. It seems like it would be so much fun. Well, Um, you know, it's funny because, and again, it's kind of knowing that personality. I have a little test that I have for teachers because some children, myself included, if I have a paintbrush or a pen or anything in my hand, I shut the world out. So Mm -hmm. it's really about knowing, um, and yet other people, that's how they learn, that it's how they, they bring it in and they can hear everything. So it, it's it's a good idea to know what what kind of personality you are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier that um, 
you have them ask a question. Is that something that you do at the beginning of the process? Is you, you have them ask like an internal question that kind of sparks the process? Well, I find that a lot of people will come, um, if, if it's their first time doing this, they're a little bit nervous, so I don't have them really think about anything. And you don't have to. Um, but as, as you go along with, I have, I have so many journals. I, I probably go through uh, one or two a year. Um, oftentimes that's where I go to with my questions. Um, and the answers are always very unexpected. They're not, you know, they're not your typical, um, you know, they're very simplistic and peaceful. Um, so, but in the beginning, in the beginning of these, these courses, it's really trusting your intuition. It's trusting the fact that, that it's all connected and that your, that your colors and your hand movement even some of the symbols and shapes that you make. Um, so it's, it's beginning to trust that intuition. Once you trust that, it's great to start. I just ask questions. Um, right. And I always, always get answers. That's wonderful. Yeah, it seems like this, for, for the common Westerner who seems to struggle with meditation, this seems like such a powerful tool to introduce them to what it feels like to drop into that meditative state. I, I, yeah. I agree with that wholeheartedly, yeah. Yeah, just the losing time, and I think that's so important. And, of course, the arts, as I'm sure you know, working in public schools, um, from what I understand, the funding is not what it used to be. And I've even heard of some public schools getting rid of art programs completely, which is, of course, heartbreaking. But um, what well, has been your it, experience it, with it, that? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the end of that. Oh, what's been your experience with that? Well, I, I, it's it's very interesting. I'm I'm very lucky. I live in a very small community um, and and have a great relationship with with our educators here. And um, a lot of the schools have just allowed me to come in and show them how very inexpensively, how quickly they can use this tool first thing in the morning. So the kids will, you know, they come in off the bus. Anything that they've brought into school from home gets dumped on that piece of paper. Um, you know, and, and you're talking about 10, 15 minutes to the day. Um, and it just makes this huge difference, a huge yeah. difference. Absolutely. It allows them to release the things that have been building up as they were right. away from school. Yeah. And, and because the teachers can now have a different vocabulary and language, you don't have to say to a child, how are you? You can say, wow, you know what, you look really full today. Let me know how um, I can help you. It's a very wow. different conversation. Yeah, that's so much. Wow, I love that. So much more powerful. Yeah. Robin, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick commercial break, but I want to talk about how you actually came to be involved with ARE when we get back. So okay, we will great. be right back with more from Robin Wimbiscus here on Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. Welcome back to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. Joining me today on the show is Robin Wimbiscus, and we're talking about intuitive art and art journaling and how she's been able to bring that into the public school system and, of course, the results that she's gained from that. Robin, I want to talk about how did this process of developing this technique bring you to work with the ARE and, of course, with the Casey material? Well, when I, when I first started... Um understanding that I could understand this communication of these colors, I thought I was just, um, I knew it was a gift, but I also felt um, a little bit odd, you know, like, how do you explain this? What is this exactly? Um, right. And the more I got comfortable with it and the more I was doing it and the more I was researching it, I, I couldn't find anyone else that was doing exactly what I was doing. Um, and then a friend of mine um, asked me about if I had read anything on Edgar Casey on his reading of auras, of which I hadn't, and I knew a little bit about Edgar Casey, but not to the extent that 
that I know now. Um, and so I, I read it's just this little booklet um, on, on, on his experience reading auras, and I just felt such a connection. And the colors and the, and the meanings were so similar um, to reading somebody's aura. I have a lot more colors on my palette, um, but I, I felt like I was home. So I called the ARE um, and was just given this list of books to read that was just so insightful. Um, and I feel like I've always been one of those people that experiences things and have things happen, and then, then they get validated afterwards. Um, so right. that's, how, that's how I felt. Um, and so I have, I have been wanting to come home for a long time. <laughs> that's wonderful. So what, as you explore the Casey material, um, what my two cents would be, Casey says the colors are vibrations. Of course, he says everything is vibrations. And mm-hmm. you talked a bit about auras, which um, from the Casey material, he says the auras, the colors really blend together, which of course you immediately think of watercolors as the colors mm-hmm. blend together. Can you kind of hash that out for us? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, y- you know, when I, when I research a lot of the um, other people's, I don't know, analysis on colors, they, they, they keep everything very separate. So it's, you know, it's red, blue, yellow, um, but life doesn't work that way. You know, right. it, it is definitely a mixture. Um, and, and by reading those mixtures, that's how we can tell, is it something that you are thinking about? Is it something that you are feeling? Is it something that you're doing? Um, so it's all very different. And it, it also moves. It, it, it shifts and it moves and it changes with our thought patterns. Um, and so, um, you know, you can tell when, when your thought patterns and your being is just kind of in harmony. Um, and you can tell when it's off just by looking at these paintings. And I just felt that connection with, with um, Casey's work, along with, along with a lot of numbers and symbols that show up in paintings as well. And the, the book Soul Signs was huge for me to just validate some of those shapes and symbols um, and where they're coming from. So it was very helpful. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about how your company Realign came to be about? Well, and again, I wanted it to be an educational um, service where um, I, I, I want to have as many people use this tool as possible. And especially, it was, it was very different being in a, in a private therapeutic school. It was a whole different world. Um, but the, the mission of, you know, public education is very different, um, bringing, kind of bringing those two worlds together. Um, it's a little bit, a little bit of a challenge, and but but the educators and the teachers have been so receptive because it works. Right. Absolutely. So so that's what you know. That's what realign is. I have a, a online mentoring. I, I help with businesses. I help individuals, and um, and of course the school systems. Right. And we talked a bit about past lives earlier, and the past life art. Um, mm-hmm. Past lives, of course, is something that traditionally people put off to psychotherapy in that type of setting. Have you been working with any psychotherapists and helping to kind of incorporate this into their practices as well? You know, I haven't yet, and I would love to. Um, right. This is, again, be- because, I, because I walk those two different lines of, you know, the, the uh, public education world and then, you know, the, the past life world. Um, I, I, I just, the, 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 uh, sorry, the past life paintings and pieces, I really end up doing with people who find it out um, afterwards, really. So I, right. haven't, I haven't dove into that as much as I would like to. And for you personally, has this been a tool that you've used to help connect with your past lives and get messages? It's been incredible. It has right. really taught me who I am and why my passion is so important, and, and, and for me, because, like I said, I, I walk those two different worlds, to do it without fear and, and without judgment has been um, incredible, um, right. because, it, because I feel it's that important. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I wanted to relate this to, how has your connection with nature been an important part of your spiritual journey? Because I've, I've looked at a lot of your paintings, and there seems to be this theme of just 
uh, very naturey things will come up. Um, how, how has your connection with that been for your spiritual journey? Well, it's funny. Again, I don't feel that there is any um, disconnect. It's, it's so, so connected. Um, and it was uh, just recently, like I said, finding, finding um, you know, different um, validations for everything that, that, that I do. Um, ran into um, Ted Andrews' work um, and, and his similarity to, to Casey's um, symbolism as well. Um, I live in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. I live all in this beautiful green area and um, connect with nature. Um, it's funny, when, it, when, I, when I struggle, when I'm asking questions, if I take a walk, I always find a feather, always. And every single feather goes into my journals. Um, so I don't feel that there's a, um, any, you know, disconnect between everything that we do in our life and, and animals and nature um, are just such an important piece to listen to as well. They have a lot to teach Absolutely. us. And in talking about nature, your work has been published in many nationally acclaimed pub- publications, um, Organic Gardener, Mother Earth News, just to name a couple on that whole nature theme. What has it been like to have your work published? And then also, what has the feedback been for that? Well, it's been wonderful. Um, you know, I, I started as everything that I do, just kind of um, just felt very, very honored and grateful that that, that experience happened. Um, I started off, you know, illustrating plants, plants and, and my garden, and, you know, very lucky that all of the things I'm so passionate about I get to share. Um, so it's really fun to, to have them still kind of out there. Um, I don't do as much illustrating as I used to for other people's books. I do create, um, interestingly enough, I create handmade books for families if they're struggling with um, just different in just different kind of life issues, either if it's around death um, or some tolerance issues. So I will make handmade books for these families using the children's names and, and having these little lessons. So I, I keep my illustrating kind of up to par that way. Right. And in that process, do you do you find do you have a method where you try to connect with the family? Is it just through verbally talking to them and getting their background, and then you just go from there and let your intuition flow out? Well, a lot of times, you know, I I meet with them um, and really meet with what what they're struggling with as a family. And and what I find interesting is that children are such good teachers. I mean, the reasons they have anything is so as parents, you know, will respond will respond differently. So I, I, I do know that um, a lot of times, you know, the parents keep a lot of these fears alive for, for our children. And I find that if we can let the fears leave the parents, that they no longer exist in the child. So I really like to work with whole families. Um, you know, just, just one, just work, it, it, it's not one person. It, we're, again, it's, um, it's working with the whole unit. Right. And you talked about fear release, which is an incredibly powerful tool. What other health benefits have you seen from getting to channel this, uh, this art, art uh, form? Well, and again, in, the, the, the results from different people are just amazing. And again, it's that, it's that you're changing your thought patterns and you're changing through awareness, through, oh, that's, that's what's going on with me. So the, the whole premise of, of all of this is that we're not broken. We're, there's nothing wrong with us. We need to look at ourselves and say, wow, this is me. I'm pretty cool. Um, this is what works, and this is how I'm going to make me better. It's not really about focusing on, um, you know, the things that, that, that aren't working for us. So I've seen weight loss, um, tremendous weight loss in people. Um, I had one young girl who was 22, and she was on, I don't know, 13 different types of medicine um, for high blood pressure, for um, onset of diabetes, depression. Um, She had severe, severe OCD, which was just these intrusive thoughts. Um, And today, she's not taking any of them. Um, Wow. she's, She's doing really well. 
because she and and she's been doing this work for probably a year now. And when I say work, it's like just you know, it's it's painting, it's exploring, it's asking yourself those real questions, and then it's saying to myself, "Wait a minute, I really like me. I like me." Right. <laughs> um, and, it, and it's amazing what it will change. Yeah, it's kind of an uh, artistic form of psychotherapy in a way. You know, you're yes. getting results that are very similar along the same lines of what a psychotherapist would be able to accomplish. And it seems like you're accomplishing it even faster. It happens. It, it's, you know, it's, it's funny. I always tell people, you know, it, it comes to you as fast as you are capable of taking it. And it's, it's right. all on your own pace, you know, and there are days when you just say, nope, I don't, I don't want to learn anything today. I'm done. Not today. Um, and then you pick it up. It's just, it's just a progression. But it's funny, um, you know, once you know, once you know who you are, everything changes. It just cannot right. stay the same. When you talk about knowing who you are, I think that's one of the most, if not the most powerful thing about art is it allows you to connect to who you are. Coming from, I'm a musician, of course, I, I do art just as a, a form of expressing myself and actually a form of meditation and music, music is the same thing for me. Um, would you agree with that? Oh, so much. Yeah. So much. In fact, I, in one of um, Casey's books, um, one of the it was so fascinating to me, um, and I still would love to have somebody play with me on this one. But they said that um, that the the vibration and the frequencies of music match different colors, mm -hmm. and I would think it'd be so much fun to paint a picture and put it to music. Yeah. Wow, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So if you want to they do even, that with me, you let me know. <laughs> Absolutely. And they yeah. even talk about, I've heard some researchers have talked about um, different parts of your body even emit, emit different vibrations, which could also coordinate with that. You could really hash this out. To, oh, that would be amazing. Know, yeah, it would be like a unified field theory. It could be brilliant. <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, for, when we're talking about the Casey material, I've, I've done quite a bit of research into the past life material that's come up with Casey. And he... A lot of people in past lives, he talks about the arts that they're involved in, almost to the point where you might think that the arts were much more important in the past, and not so much important, but they played a bigger role in society as far as um, the artist being a much more respected and, of course, sought after um, position. Um, have you have you found that in your work um, that you know art is just you know in, in, incredible as as you know, a way of expressing yourself, obviously, but um, how, how important is the arts for, you know, everybody out there? Well, uh, I just feel like, especially when I'm doing my, my paintings, um, I feel like it's a lost tool. Right. You know, that, and, and, I, and I hear, when I hear people say, well, I'm not an artist, or, oh, I can't do that, or, you know, oh, they're the ones who are good at that, um, I think that's the mindset that I, I really want to change. Um, so many adults will come into my workshop and they just, you, you can tell they're not breathing. They're just so anxious about the fact that they have to do art. Um, right. So there's, there's this really um, stigma put on it. And I, you know, I always have to premise it. We're not, we're, we're just, we're, we're letting colors go. Uh, what I find interesting, like in the, um, when I was teaching, a lot of the students that came in, like I said, they didn't like school, they didn't like art, they didn't like anything. So this, this backdoor approach, what happened was it built so much confidence and it was such an enjoyable place to be. I would say 98% of my students actually went on to art school afterwards. Wow. Um, I found fascinating. Um, and they were brilliant. They were just for these kids who never did art before at all, um, did quite well. Right, absolutely. I think art is something that is just intuitively ingrained in us and it's whether, you know, everybody of course has their own unique way of expressing that, but it is it's the core of our being. I think art is actually a way of our soul to communicate. It's it's the form that our soul communicates. Absolutely. And then to to put limits on those is is sad. Right, absolutely. Well, Robin, we're going to take another quick break, but we will be right back to talk more with Robin Wimbiscus about intuitive art here on Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Cayce.
Welcome back to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. Joining us today on the show is Robin Wimbiscus, and we're talking about intuitive art and the incredible potential for just healing the soul and the wonderful things that she's been able to accomplish with it. Um, Robin, we were talking a little bit about, um, of course, this connection with Casey. And why do you think that he talks a lot about music, literature, dancing, and of course, painting all being intimately linked when he, when he refers to people's past lives? He said, you know, you were involved in all of these things. Why do you think all these arts are so intimately linked together? Well, you know, and I, I'm always convinced that they, they just, they stick with our soul DNA. And right. that, um, you know, when I, when I look at my, my, my past life paintings, um, and I have a lot of references to um, American Indians. Um, I know my tribes were there. A lot of different, um, you know, Incas and native type type. Um, tribes and it's all connected to the earth you know and right. and in a very simplified way of even we're just it's all connected to the earth um right. and we are too and i think that sometimes we forget that and and the arts bring us back to that that remembering absolutely and we talked earlier about about you mentioned it's kind of a lost tool this form of art and of course, I, I believe that it was something that was much more incorporated into daily practices as well as social cultures. Um, why do you think it's a lost art and why do you think it doesn't, maybe not as a powerful or as, as a tool that's as tapped into as it used to be? Well, and again, you know, when, when I paint, you know, it, the, it, it comes through my body, through my hands, through the paintbrush, through that movement. And I and music does as well as does dance, as does all of those things. And you know, I I, I look now today, and and I'm not against technology in any way, shape, or form. But when we have forgotten how to write, and it's not so much that we can hand write, it's the movement and the flow and that rhythm. Um, those are the those are the parts and pieces. Um, that keep taking us further and further away from exploring from from the from the arts part or the experimenting part and the playing um, and all of those. We live in a very very rushed world, so experimenting right. and playing kind of have to come, you know, last. Right. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I I'm not against the technology, but um, I think. And a lot of people speak about this in their work that we, we kind of, our body, our, our soul, everything that makes our being is the ultimate technology and all the technologies that we're creating externally are just trying to create what we have, we're capable of internally. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I'm sitting here laughing a little bit thinking because, you know, you play music and I'm, I'm not, I sing, but in my own, in my own space with my own thing and I dance the same way. So I think we all have our own things that, you know, we will we will share publicly, but but there's other art forms that we just need to do in our backyard just because. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, and I think that brings up a good point of the the judgmentalness. I think what what I'm gaining from your work is that you want to create an environment of no judgment, which I think is essential for all spiritual work. Because when you talk about a lot of people do things in their privacy you know, of their own home. For me personally, when I do my dancing, it's in the privacy of my own home for the most part, <laughs> yeah. you know? So yeah, I think that, that, that well, environment you know, of I, no judgment I, is essential, when I right? Bring my, I bring my journals with me anytime I do workshops. And um, when I first started um, sharing, and it's not just the artwork, it's the whole experience. It's the whole human experience, and it's not always pretty. Um, and when I first started sharing them, I was nervous and I was embarrassed, right. and I was many things. But as I got more and more used to being whole and being really comfortable with it, with who I was, um, I realized that, that by allowing, sharing that intimate part of me, it gave other people permission to also just be human. Um, right. My life is not any different than anyone else's, and, and yet we feel... So by, by sharing these very <laughs> intimate journals, um, I, I really do get a sense to be very connected, which is um, very warm. I love it, even though it's hard. Right. Absolutely. 
And that raised a point in my mind as you were saying that, that I think what happened with this kind of lost tool of art and of course this intuitive art form that you have, have brought to the table is I think art was, and all forms of art, have been ridiculed and judged over the years. So of course there's now been this stigma attached to it where people um, no longer feel as comfortable and we're learning again to become comfortable with expressing all your forms of art because at this point in modern times there is an, just an incredible amount of ways of expressing your art and we're seeing I think with technology we're getting the opportunity to glimpse into these new forms of art that we never thought would be possible and of course with technology playing into that there's just an incredible amount of art and I think people are, are dropping that, that judgment barrier, that fear and allowing themselves to express it, which I think is such an incredible hallmark of the time that we live right now. I see so many amazing, wonderful things, and, and I think that um, for me, I just, I really get inspired. I just, it, yeah. it, it makes, it, I don't know, it ups my energy level to, to go, oh, I want to try this. So yeah, I agree. Right. Absolutely. And the scale in which people are creating art now is, is phenomenal with the things that they're capable of. Um, you are a feature presenter at the upcoming ARE New Year's conference. Can you give us a little insight as to what your program will entail? Yes, and I'm so excited. I'm so <laughs> very excited. Um, the, the very first thing is everybody's going to come in and do a watercolor. Um, that's Wonderful. how I start all of my workshops. Um, in the course of the, um, the workshop, you'll, you'll end up doing um, between three and four different watercolors. Um, and each one of them will be directed for a very specific reason to know yourself a little bit further um, and to kind of see where you are. But um, it's always fun in the beginning because you, you do these watercolors, and then I walk you through what your colors mean and what those colors with every other color means. So it's just like you kind of get a personal introduction to who you are. Um, right. And then the other paintings that follow that are to celebrate who you are and to find out, you know, okay, what are, what are you not looking at? What do you need to look at? Um, what's going to make your life a little bit better? Um, and then at the very end, um, I've just been so honored. I'll, I'll be able to stay. And for anyone who would like a private reading or a session, um, I'm going to be there. So if anybody wants to meet with me afterwards and I can look at their colors more in depth and really explain, um, just personally, what their paintings are saying and, and where they can go from there. Right. Wonderful. We'll look forward to that. How, what do you hope um, the people who attend your program and, of course, have attended your workshops in the past, and, of course, your students, what is your ultimate hope that they take away from this form of intuitive art? Um, first, I want them to know it's a tool that they can use on their own to just go someplace to really get real answers, you know, to to understand that their intuition is, is there. It, it just, just turn it on, turn it up, and listen to it. Um, and I find that, you know, we really have two voices um, that, that, we, that we have, that we hear. And, and one I kind of describe as that, just that old tape recording message of why we can't do things, why the world won't let me, why, why, why we can't. And the other one is that intuitive voice that sometimes can yell at you, too, that says, no, do it. You can do that. Of course you can do that. So, and they sound very different. And so I would love everybody to come away with at least understanding and hearing their intuitive voice um, so they know which one to follow. Um, right. And then use this as a tool for themselves on their own. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. And can we talk a little bit about your book, Listening to My Painting, A Guide to Learning the Language of Color? I love the title of this book, so I'd love to hear more about kind of how it came about and Thank what you. the book, of course, includes. Yes, this has been the most difficult project in the world. I myself <laughs> have a ton of, um, I don't know, learning disabilities. Writing is, is, is brutal. Spelling is even worse. So this book, is, <laughs> this book has been um, years in the making. Um, and with the help of my son, who is a brilliant editor, I'm really fine-tuning it so that it is a, a really wonderful manual and guide um, for people to, to bring with them in the classroom, in their homes, in their work environments, um, so that 
each and every color is described as what are we looking at when when you see this particular color there are many different shades of blue and all of those blues in of themselves without anything else mixed in actually mean something different and so i've tried to really spell it out as cleanly as possible which is really hard for me <laughs> so um I, I i like to put stories in everywhere and it just messes everything up so um, I have little examples and stories on the side, but hopefully this will be a manual that you can just look at a color and say, okay, this is, this is, what I, this is a question I need to ask. Um, this, is, right. this is what I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think those little stories are, are incredibly powerful, so I'm happy you included those because what you find is that story read by the, your, your readers, will, they'll make synchronicities, they'll make connections, and it just answers questions for them and allows you know their own expression to, to flow out of them, which is an incredibly powerful tool in itself. Well, I was just happy that he guided me to kind of put them onto the side, <laughs> not in the <laughs> middle of everything. So. Right, understandable. Um, Casey often spoke of ideals in his readings. How important is having an ideal when you're teaching or creating artistic expressions? And do, does an artist's ideals show up in their artwork for you personally? Well. You know, again, it's, uh, it's, uh, I do a little after school, a couple of after school programs with my local kids. I just, I absolutely love. And one of the words that we're working on um, is authenticity, and just being authentic and right. finding out what that, what is that for you? Um, and I, and I think that that has to come out in, in every person in their artwork and. Um, without the worries of judgment, without those worries of fear. Um, but I think it's very difficult for people to say, you know, what is, what is being authentic? So um, right. it's, a, it's a huge part. Yeah, I think that's such a powerful tool because that's really something they don't teach so much in school anymore is how to not only intuitively connect to yourself but how to authentically learn how to be yourself because – of course, peer pressure and fitting in is generally the forefront of uh, the public school system or just ra- you know, growing up in general. So I think this is an incredibly powerful method that you've developed. Well, and I think it's also, again, we're talking about teaching adults as well because, because it, you know, it's like which, which is better um, you know, to say I didn't have any homework or I had homework but I'm just not doing it. Right. You know, it's, right. It's, it, they're two different kind of conversations with two different types of responses. Um, so, you know, we're really pulling it way, way back to this is, this is really who I am. This is the truth. This is the truth about me. Um, you know, we can work through some of this stuff, but this is the truth. Right. And I think that's where we're headed is this be, becoming authentic and learning how to be authentic. That is kind of a spiritual draw that's that's drawing everybody towards learning that it's a it's kind of a theme of what's going on amongst uh human population right now which is wonderful and it's difficult Um, it it looks a little messy mm. (laughs) (laughs) absolutely but i mean that's what spiritual work is it's a process it's not something as casey said it's not something that comes immediately it's it's you know step by step putting things into place making the connection and of course not beating yourself up along the way Absolutely, which is another good reminder. I often have to remind people who work so hard to play once in a while and just to breathe. Right, absolutely. I'm curious personally, aside from the readings discussion uh, from the Casey material of color and vibration, which is, is a wonderful thing in itself, what else from the Casey readings has resonated with you over the years? Oh, almost everything. His life in general, I just find so fascinating. Um, you know, choices that he had to make, the choices between, um, you know, having, having this gift that, that he just gave so freely, um, and, and the money component. I think a lot of people have, have issues with, with money um, in, in one capacity or another, and what do, you, what do you give away for free and at what cost? Um, right. And what and it, it, his whole I think about I, I have to say in my in, especially in a, trying to start a new business and trying to especially this type of a business um, I do better in my head when I know I'm a teacher um, I don't I, I give 
a lot of me away as a spiritual guide, and and I love, I love that in him. So yeah, his life in general, I just connect with um, on a daily basis, really. Absolutely. And as kind of a final question, what is your hope for intuitive art and what you brought to the table for the future? I would love it to be mainstream. I would like it to be this fact, just a tool. Oh, yeah. You know, just it's, it's such a, it's a very simple, inexpensive um, method. I, I just feel like I'm bringing something back. I don't feel like I've invented anything new. It's just... This was here before, um, right. and we used to use it, and it was very simple. Um, and and I, I, want it, I want this method to change communication, and I want it to change responses that we, that we give to each other. Um, right. Because our responses could use a little work. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think you're spot on. I think you're right with that. I think that's where we're headed. And, of course, I... I believe your your work is going to definitely play a, play a role in that, and it'll definitely branch out. So, we'll keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best for that. Oh, thank you. Of course, Robin. It's been an honor to have you on the show, and it's just been a delight talking to you. So, thank you so much for your life work and what you brought to the table. And of course, thank you for being a part of the ARE family. We're honored to have you. Well, like I said before, I'm just so excited to come home. So, thank you very much. Absolutely. We look forward to seeing you here in Virginia Beach, and thank you so much for joining us on the show today. You're welcome. Robin, thank you so much for joining us today on Reflections. It was an honor to have you on. Robin is a feature presenter at the upcoming ARE New Year's Conference from December 29th through the 31st, and of course that's here in Virginia Beach at the ARE headquarters. This year's program, entitled The Creative Edge, a hands-on retreat for inspiring and unleashing your dynamic, intuitive self, includes practices to engage, engage the creative forces such as journaling, mandalas, and life seals. And of course, we'll have a festive New Year's party with music, dancing, and refreshments. For more details, and of course, to register for this and other conferences we offer here at the ARE, you can visit our website at edgarcasey.org conferences. On behalf of everyone here at the Association for Research and Enlightenment and moretalk.tv, I'm your host, Brenton Bickerstaff, reminding you that everything you experience can be made to be a stumbling block or a stepping stone. The choice is, of course, yours. Have a wonderful day, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in to Reflections. And now it's time for the thought for the day here on Reflections. And joining us as always is Dr. Bill Austin. Bill, thank you so much for joining us on Reflections for the thought for the day. Thank you for having me, Brent. Always a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Honored to have you on. And if you can go ahead and read the thought for the day this week. I'd be happy to. This comes from reading 922-1. There is that access then, that way to the throne of grace, of mercy, of peace, of understanding within your own self. For he has promised to meet you in your own temple, in your own body, through your own mind. Enter into the Holy of Holies within your own consciousness. Turn within, see what has prompted you, and he has promised to meet you there. And there shall it be told to you from within the steps you should take, day to day, step by step. Not that some great exploit, some great manner of change should come within your body, your mind, but line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Again, we're reminded to go inside. That's where we can have our personal connection with the divine and be in touch with the Christ consciousness that uh, the Casey readings talk about. And we will be polished, kind of like a rock in a stream, 
you know, as that water flows over the top of it, it starts to get smooth, it starts to shine. And I feel like we're being cleaned up on the inside so it can be reflected on the outside. And it's not that we're going to go through some huge physical change or some, some mental change or play some tremendous role uh, out in the world. We'll be polished on the inside so that we can manifest that divine on the outside on a day-to-day -day basis with the little things that we do. And when he talks about line upon line, precept upon precept, precept, it's part of that tumbling, part of that polishing. And uh, it makes us a little better at doing the best we can. Right. Kind of an unfolding process. Yeah. That's great. I love this reading. It's uh, it's really empowering. As you stated, its focus is, is the within. The focus is realizing that you have that power within to, uh, he says, you know, to, to find the throne of grace, of mercy, of peace, of understanding. All of that is contained within your own self. And I think that's a, a beautiful idea that's needed probably now more than ever. Um, and it, it, it's something that kind of really makes Casey's approach unique because it, it brings the prayer and the meditation both into a nice balance. And then, of course, as you touched on, the, the Casey Hallmark is, like I said, he, he, he wasn't perfect. He just said that you have to every single day just try, just get up again and try and have that focus, that, that place of peace that you can always go to. It's a retreat of just that silence, that, that source, um, which he constantly went to. And... Um, Excuse me. You you don't. It's not. It's not going to be something that's going to take place overnight. But he says if you if you pay attention to it, um, it's not going to be some extreme thing. But you'll feel little differences, little shifts that take place. And like you said, you can carry that um, out into the world, which is a, an incredibly powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. It's such a wonderful way to to focus and then apply. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining us today on Thought for the Day. It's always a pleasure hearing your words. Thank you, Brent. Always a pleasure to be here. I look forward to doing it again. Have a great Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Thank you. You too.